Just um, Thank you. 
Probably on a watch list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a dossier. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Standing by a Zach, you know what the student membership fee is? Five dollars. Cheaper than lunch.
Uh, before that, I'd like to announce the 2018 uh, winner of the Lehigh Hensky Award is Mark Chan. Oh, here's very important. Schools who 
keep looking at scholarship. Again, we did see this year's higher than usual, but uh, we felt there are a lot of certain candidates and kind of got a good description of diversity. Kind of sad to not see any UVB students in there, but I think because they did not Hopefully that's my understanding that it wasn't a lot of and uh, with that, I'll uh, turn over the floor to back. Oh, yeah, there's only five. I left out the U. I'm yeah, three to the U as well. Bring up your. Uh, that the one you're looking for? Hopefully, I mean, kind of hard to see the numbers. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, we do have paper copies of this as well. That are hard to see. Um, this is our, our financial year ended in uh, September 30th uh, last month, um, or October 1st, 2017. And this is the year in summary um, broken up by revenue on the top here and expenses on the bottom. Um, these are different types of revenue and expenses. So uh, um, I'll just run through a few of these things. Um, Total dues uh, peaked around January, December, um, at about $2,700. Um, had a few miscellaneous income, mostly uh, credit, credit card. Um, luncheon brought in $2,800. Uh, these three categories are AAPG. Um, the top one is the Rocky Mountain Section Reading Share. Which I think brought in a total of uh, eight hundred twenty-seven dollars last so on the uh, Rocky Mountain section meeting that we took. Bill, yes, the PGA sponsored field trips and short courses for the AAPT annual convention brought in nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-seven dollars and fifty-three cents. So. A lot of you guys were interested in how much the meeting got in. It did really, really well. Jason Blake and all of his contributors did a great job coordinating that and making that happen. Um, let's see. The annual meeting, the registrations, uh, we got a part of the profit uh, from the registration for the annual convention that happened in May. Um, in this fiscal year, uh, we brought in $27,000.47. Um, we just received the rest of that money uh, last week, so that would be the next fiscal year. Um, but I will show you those films in just a minute. So, Mike Vandenberg uh, was the main coordinator on that. He did a great job uh, bringing a lot of money for it. Yeah. Let's see. These next few lines are. Um, we've got a grant from AG Academic Section to help with guidance publishing costs um, of fifteen hundred dollars. So thanks to AG for that. Have a benefit, benefit uh, as I mentioned. Um, again, our bookstore sales uh, have done pretty well throughout this year. There's a big jump here, a thousand dollars in July. I was likely some all the sales that happened again at the annual convention. So a total of two thousand dollars, hundred dollars to do that. Um, data pages brought in about fifty one hundred dollars throughout the year. Guidebook contributions from uh, Bryce Cummings, uh, April twenty eighth, eight hundred dollars. Um, T shirts have brought in one hundred eighty two dollars so far. So buy a T shirt. Uh, the fall club will be available in book first time. The golf tournament for 2017 brought in $4,700. Uh, I haven't received a check yet for last month's uh, golf tournament, so that will be our next financial year. Scholarship um, donations throughout the year have been through small donations from all the members of $538, and then 
$555. Any questions on revenue before I go this far? Total revenue is the question $152,111.50. All right, expenses, again, broken down. These yellows are mostly kind of operating expenses, uh, tax, tax preparation, uh, office supplies, website maintenance, insurance, um, bank fees, business license agreements, and office expenses. Uh, I don't know what those total, but maybe around $2,000 or something like that. Um, luncheons, we spent $4,934 on lunch this year. Um, that's not including the picnic. Um, annual picnic, uh, $800. A few expenses for um, AAPGs and your lectures. Um, and then these are here are the expenses for the AAPG annual convention and the future for short courses. Um, the short courses for Financial year total so sixty eight thousand seven hundred and ninety two dollars for the expenses and uh, we spent about thirty four hundred dollars on the uh, annual convention. Let's see, guidebook publishing, the majority of that expense is actually just came in for the next fiscal year. Uh, this year we spent about nine hundred dollars. Um, and then teacher of the year field camp scholarships, like Paul mentioned, we gave out fifteen scholarships, about a thousand dollars apiece. So we made about fifteen thousand uh, dollars in scholarships for good them, which is great. Um, let's see what else we got. Donations and financial award, um, twenty one hundred dollars. Some of those, a lot of that went to the Geologic uh, uh, Petrified Book of Park that uh, Paul just mentioned that we will be looking into soon, um, and a few other things like the Eastern Chapter of uh, University. Shirts. Uh, we spent thousand dollars roughly on shirts. Um, so buy more shirts. Four hundred dollars underwater right now. Yeah. Okay. Can you scroll down? So our total expenses um, are a hundred thousand two hundred and five dollars. So here's kind of the bottom line. Um, we spent. Thousand dollars on, or brought in six thousand dollars on uh, on education. Oops, sorry, there's a little lag. There you go. Um, spent seventeen thousand uh, dollars. Guidebooks brought in eleven thousand dollars. Spent nine hundred this fiscal year. Um, APG field trips and should also say the annual convention. Um, Income $127,210, and it's spent $72,000. So we have a big profit there for $54,000 for this fiscal year. Um, lunches, we spent, we brought in $2,800 and spent about $6,000. So, uh, as Paul mentioned, this has been pretty typical for each year. We've subsidized about $3,000 to $3,500 in lunches. Um, and general income and operation costs. Seven thousand and spent thirty-four. Um, this is our total account balance of September thirtieth, two thousand eighteen. Yeah. I will show you that. Any other questions? So uh, you can make it easy. And I'll do my best. Come on. Um, these are the field trips, um, and their expenses, and the revenue from registration for those field trips and short courses. And in bold here at the bottom is the profit for each. 
on most field trips because it really keeps all the field trip and short course leaders for putting in time and effort and keeping the organization money. Um, total uh, income from the registration was, like I said, 99,997. Uh, uh, we spent about 70,000 for our profit there on uh, field trips and short courses of $30,000. And then uh, for the annual convention, we spent $3,400 on various things. And uh, in this fiscal year, we brought in um, $2,700.27. And we just got the check that will show up the next fiscal year for $64,700. Total $91,740. Gives EGA a profit of $88,254.41. So, with another $30,000 on top of that, uh, brought in over $100,000. So, big, big thank you to Mike and all the teams that did that. And all the Exactly. Okay. Now that Zach has warmed up the crowd a little bit. So, uh, yeah. There's a lot of talk with the board about being fiscally responsible. And, you know, we won't always have a great deal of mic and back for us. So we can't depend on the But right now, there are major source of income. Like, they're separated by several years. So we kind of have to try to make them last and try to make other decisions that help us continue our stream of income to match that with our donations. It's very positive. Which both requires a lot of devotion and time, but it's definitely worthwhile. Definitely. Yeah, for, for those who are interested, uh, it's definitely worthwhile. I, I've been involved for a lot of years. Uh, very little. Get on it, Peter. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, Carson in Southern Cash County. It's focusing on a three. Uh, we, um, the UDF and George Andre and Water Association, found in Cash County. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, a practice. It's going to be very similar to what I'm going to present in Indianapolis for my GSA uh, oral presentation there. Scott and Don, and things uh, wrong with this, feel free to chime in, correct me after the fact. You guys are very familiar with the area. Um, Jeff and Kirby uh, work on this. <laughs> Pretty much the first author. And he let me put my name first in this case. So, um, but he, he can bring you quite a bit to this. We um, work together on it. So, uh, this, this is kind of a side project, yes, special study one thing here, where we characterize the situation uh, for Powder Mountain, which straddles the county boundary between Cleaver and Cash County, the so, southern and Cash County. And uh, this was a this was a really fun project. It's an amazing place. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on there. Uh, I only have enough time to really talk about a few of them. Something you were mentioning previous parts were done in the immediate north. A lot of that has been done by various bankers and the uh, there's been a 
recent master's thesis come out where the a lucky master's student got to explore main drain cave uh, up, up in Bear River Range as her thesis. She got to map it. And that's uh, Kirsten Barr, a uh, fellow uh, USU alum. Both of those are available online. Uh, Larry did a lot of good work delineating recharge zones for car spring. But a lot of these springs, uh, here's for those of you unfamiliar, this is Rick Spring, the big car spring right next to the, the highway that was in the uh, pretty spectacular spring. Another, uh, this is another major spring of Spring Hollow, actually named Spring Hollow, up the Philippines as well. So a lot of these springs that we see up in the Bear River Range, we will also see on Cash County side of uh, uh, the study area. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, one of the springs that we focus in on, the Curiosity Spring, is this uh, Curiosity Spring near Ashton, Wyoming. Uh, and it has a cycle on the scale of minutes where it discharged fluctuates significantly. And we'll talk about the mechanism behind that. But it's a really awesome place to visit here in your app. It's worth the view. Yeah, cool. Um, then, so here is a general background of the geology of the area. This is uh, an oblique uh, Google Earth view looking to the northwest. Uh, this light green line here is the county boundary between uh, Weber and Cache County. And the, the main takeaway from this, as you can see it, is this uh, very uh, beautiful, broad uh, incline that is going across the picture. So here's kind of the margins of that. And it's plunging to the uh, north. And uh, the Powder Mountain Resort and some of the development going on around it is all happening kind of on the Weaver side, right next to uh, abutting the county line, right up here on top of the mountain. There's the there's the highway for the uh, scale and there. And so uh, Stefan made a couple of cross sections for the special study. Uh, here's an east-west one going through the incline. Uh, you can see the major uh, units to point out here is the Grizzly Canyon Port site, which is a relatively tight. Uh, quartzite unit and then overlying, uh, various overlying carbonate units which have varying degrees of connectivity. Um, and then the uh, north south section, you can kind of see the plunge of the fold. And there again is the, the quartzite unit and the overlying carbonate. And then draped right on top of the carbonate is the tertiary age watch formation uh, experience of that structure. Part of the, the thing that spurred uh, the Connor Mountain study was uh, this exploration well, which, what's the official name of that well? Uh, well, the exploration well is to, uh, the two of the exploration wells that go up there, and the two of them are the production well, the main well. The thing that well is the second one. The lower carbonate unit basically got involved in the third one. I actually have a strike on right here. So, yeah. So, yeah, the, the well that kind of spurred the study was one that was the carbonation. You can hear the noun in formation, uh, but there's uh, quite a thick sequence of carbonate separated by different uh, shalier members uh, in between. And uh, the Bloomington well penetrates the lower carbonate above the Jersey Canyon, and that uh, that hidden lake well penetrates up here. And then the uh, well that you guys drilled recently is the length of the huge formation. Great. So it's also in the kind of lower section, right, right here in the city. So uh, all these wells are being put in before new development is going down the mountain to make sure that there's adequate water supply, especially with some of these falls by uh and empty water as uh, what what they thought might have been surface surface water into the drain. 
Uh, speaking of spring, there were uh, one of the things that the special study found are several key kind of springs throughout the area in these different units. Uh, Stefan found that length of the spring, which is pretty decent amount of outflow right near the highway up on the leader side. Uh, and there's the Pickle 3, which is right next to the new, the new well up there, and a number of others in the mountain formation. One of the ones that focused in our special study was the left hand spring, so up on the leader side. We also examined the watershed in Cash uh, County, and several of these springs uh, were found in or, or big spring pools. The big spring goes up to a very large spring pool in the adjacent watershed at the area of the top. And one of the things we did is we did spot discharge measurements throughout uh, the watershed to the north and south of the county line. So this gray line here is the county line. Uh, here is drainage to the north. In Cache County, you have Davenport Creek, Cobay Creek here. And then to the south, uh, we have the south fork of Wolf Creek, Lefty Fork and Lefty Spring being right there. And that hidden lake well is right here, right pretty much right next to the county line, just to the south of it. And uh, the, the spring we'll be looking at that we saw that had periodicity is right in here, right on the Kobe Creek port. But all of these red spots are places that we measured discharge. And uh, there was a opposite test being conducted on the hidden lake well. Water rights had to uh, be involved in the monitoring of that. And so we set up uh, transducers at uh, along this part of Kobe Creek. And we, I think we, there are also some set up along the left east. I don't know if we had one there, but there were a couple of consulting firms that definitely had some equipment in. And uh, one thing we noticed uh, as we measured discharge, we also measured uh, specific conduction to the water. We noticed a pretty decent contrast between the port site. Uh, the water flowing at the port site, which is in green here, and the water flowing over and uh, from the overlying carbonate, which is in pink here. And this is uh, this yellow hill up here is the uh, water formation and other uh, quaternary cover. And you can see um, a, a, a measurable difference in specific conductance between green and pink, where the green is much lower. And the, and the peak is still low, but uh, measures we get 300, 200 to 300 uh, microliters per second. And so we, the four sites that were continuously gauged for uh, this oxygen from this well, one of them showed uh, some very interesting trends. Uh, and, and that's kind of what the, uh, what the kind of site study, what spurred the site study. So one thing we found as a result of the study was most of the water uh, that we're seeing in these drainages is coming from carbonate, specifically large carbonate springs, right? And about half of the flow, at least in, uh, in, in a lot of the cases, is coming from the Malman formation. So this, this is that uh, method point that I pointed out on the Kobe Creek drainage, and it was a weir installed, a facility weir installed by Provision uh, Division Water Right. We had a flat barrier up here. But it, even though it was a temporary installment, it was one of the better installments of a temporary weir I've seen. Um, and we put a transducer in behind this, as well as a uh, block of water, and, and we both monitored the the uh, flow there, the stage there, and our transducer stage reading coincided very well. And like there's some of the steps on the north side. Um, here's what we got. So we saw this, this is the high graph for that here. And every 36 hours, or, or I'm sorry, 78 hours, we were seeing uh, a massive spike in the discharge. And we're like, oh, there's obviously something wrong with our producer. <laughs> so we looked at uh, looked at 
Docker's data and they, it coincides perfectly. And we're like, okay. And they were using a totally different team of users in that. So we're like, this is probably a real thing. So the next thing I did was call Powder Mountain and ask them, are you guys dumping water over the side of the mountain every 80 hours for whatever reason? And they're like, why, would, why on earth would we do that? So we couldn't really figure out any regular anthropogenic uh and it seemed very uh, well defined in the period. That so we started digging a little deeper and we think, well, maybe there was just a regular precip interval and we really didn't get any significant precip during the sense of effect, at least none that we could think of effect stages there. Um, and and that's kind of what the precip record show. There's a nearby snow tail station, it's a little bit down elevation to the north uh, west of this this site. And another thing we looked at, because it's all the precip, the precip that did fall with snow, look at soil moisture, because maybe it had to do with melting. So we couldn't really correlate any uh, snow melt that. Uh, so uh, not too long after, uh, George Conrad sent us uh, this trail cam footage from the Colbert Creek drainage. And uh, sorry, I'm also the program chair today. Oh, was also secretary <laughs> So we'll play this little video and focus in on this area right here, so you can see the variation flow. Yeah, so it's it, um, very obviously a pulsating amount of water. And George named this spring post spring because there's a four by four in the ground nearby. So good name. And George George works for Bill, uh, and I trust his knowledge on this area. Uh, and I think he owned it on the location as well. So, there we go. So uh, we had to kind of hypothesize why you would see this kind of fluctuation in flow in a creek or spring. Um, and there's kind of three different working models uh, based on this, this uh, student who did her thesis on the um, uh, a periodic spring in Sierra Nevada. And one of them is a sediment flood model where Basically, your, your conduit gets clogged with sediment, and then when you get high enough head, that pushes the sediment out and you get some consistent flow. And we weren't seeing uh, any major, major changes in turbidity. Um, and and this, this student provided some kind of lab based hydrographs, and our hydrographs are very similar to this. Another working hypothesis is this idea of this reciprocating model. And this is the idea where you kind of have um, your your void space, and there's a small constricted channel on the bottom side that allows for some flow. And once it hits a certain point, have more flow coming through on a larger channel. And this, this also didn't really match uh, the uh, lab-based hydrographs very well. And finally. Uh, you have this idea, which is basically like the same mechanism that flushes your toilet, right? It's the cycle model. This is what they proposed at the Afton Spring, but the actually named Periodic Spring up there in Wyoming. And it's where you have uh, some kind of cycle tube near the bottom of your reservoir, and it slowly builds up to the point where it reaches the siphon, uh, the entire reservoir, where it's very much. So, uh, knowing this and, and kind of thinking this is a working model, uh, I broke down the, all the peaks and kind of smashed them against each other, and they're very consistent in shape and size with, with you know, one or two outliers. Uh, 79 hours or, or three or four days 
and it almost exactly every time about 190 percent of the flow. So it almost doubled in flow every uh, every eight-ish hours, where you went from about one two foot per second to two. And like I said earlier, we verified this in another case. The duration of that higher flow uh, occurred over about three. 3.2 hours, so much longer than what they see at the uh, periodic center at. But I think it's still similar mechanism. And we kind of took the integral of these curves and figured out that you're getting about 66,000 gallons uh, discharging. So that's kind of our estimated volume of the void space that's empty every time we have one of these. What is that? What is that size? Uh, 50,000 gallons. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I have to see at the end, too, at the conclusion. So I'll, I'll see that, too. Because that'll be, that's more reasonable for volume. And for GSA, I'm going to use this metric. This is taken out of the report. Um, so, one idea Brittany Bain had, she was working on this Power Mountain project as well, a uh, former UGF employee, is to look at the uh, variation in time between discharge and peak demand and to see if maybe climate was influencing how close these phases are far apart. These peaks occur. And uh, I just looked at this briefly and just kind of threw it on a plot. This is the amount of time between the peaks and hours. The different peak days, and then I threw the soil moisture plot uh, with it, and I'm still not seeing anything that's too much, but I think it needs more. Um, unfortunately, the, the weird plate was removed by the water rice, because I guess it went to the weird back, but there is some talk of reinstating the measuring point on the cash side, not, which I would like to see just, just out of my own scientific focus. Wanting more data. Uh, water rights probably won't get the difference, but I want to see, I want to measure more period. Um, another thing I looked at with these, uh, with these broken out curves is the recession, and this is something that parse hydrologists use quite a bit, is to measure how quickly uh, that peak recedes after it comes to the peak. And that will, that'll give you some indication of. How open your conduit is, and, or if you have a conduit, you either have a kind of flat and porous medium or some mixture of uh, porous medium and um, larger conduit or just dominant conduit flow. This is out of USGS publication. And so they came up with this alpha this measure of alpha, which gives you the idea of the prevailing flow regime. So, Get an order of thousands uh, or uh, tens of thousands for slow or diffuse flow, and that number gets larger, you, it's a better indicator that you're dealing with a climate dominated system. And this is a major issue that I think we're still going to be dealing with up there on Powder Mountain is trying try to differentiate between the harsh dominated conduit system and force medium because the aqua test. Uh, so the next up there, it looks, as for all measures to me, like a classic porous medium system. Um, but you know, how far does that kind of pressure have to extend before you catch some kind of fracture or dissolution in large system that might cause it to react differently? It's hard to say. Um, and parts can do really complicated model because of that. And we looked at the, the recession of all of those plots and they matched up pretty well with the exception of one of the larger ones, um, but very high alpha value, which suggests kind of well, as does the period density. So, I want to show my conclusion slide. Isn't that conclusion? Thinking about it. So, John, there's your cubic feet. Um, <laughs> So the uh, 
kind of the conclusions we came to so far is we wanted to verify that there's actually cars occurring down in the part of the area because we, we weren't able to in the past. Um, and so this kind of gave us some verification that there, were, there was definitely a car system in this area. There we are. 9,000. Yeah, uh, how big how big is that? Room nine thousand cubic feet. I don't know how how kind of that's volume. Um. So there's there's definitely conduit flow going on. We definitely think it's the siphon control system, just based on the behavior of the hydrograph, and and we think that that system is. Um, it's not huge, but it's big enough to influence the flow of this creek. One thing worth noting is, um, by parsing out these different signals, we, we, there was no detection of any changes associated with the output test. So that's why we're measuring these data in the first place. We couldn't find any measurable changes in the, the data from, the career, uh, from that output test. Uh, there's still a little bit of debate uh, going on there. Stefan thinks uh, it could be connected to the Nauman, uh, but what's that? Um, I'd have to. I wish I could defer to Stefan for that. It's still we're still based on George's location. It could be a, a low. Yeah, that I mean that could definitely be a possibility. And yeah, and, well, and it's fairly far away from the well too. That that uh, that might have something to do. Unfortunately, we weren't really uh, doing any kind of continuous monitoring of the chemistry uh, with these siphon-based systems. You would expect to see higher dissolved oxygen during the, the peak um, because of kind of the, the uh, flushing of the siphon system. That's based on that master student. Um, and sh that student had the luxury of finding the cavern inside that was draining. So that would be kind of cool. But uh, it would be a huge space. But it'd be neat to be able to measure both inside and outside. We don't really have that. So do we, are there any questions on that. I kind of tried to shorten my presentation a little bit, not just to practice for GSA, but also to uh, kind of give it time to review. Well, you know, there's a lot of really good data that's been collected up there. might be able to expand on this idea a little bit more. Like a little laboratory. Yeah. I think I think there needs to be a formal. I'm usually not a huge fan of um, three-dimensional models of, of this kind of setup, but I think it would I think it would do the theory justice just because the level of the kind of lends itself to that. We have enough measurements that we can get some idea of what's going on. It might help us better conceptualize the whole area. And that's one thing I already started to try to piece together a mod flow model in my spare time. But uh, yeah, well, there, there's actually packages out there that can accommodate for that. That's the problem. Is there's probably multiple flow machines, um, and it's going to be really scaled. It's hard. Well, you got to do something, right? I mean, you got to try. You got to try. Yeah, so that's kind of working at uh, Brittany's idea of how many hours to take the fill. And, and, and what kind of climate influence is there? Yeah. I really wish that we had 
spring data, like uh, data from the spring runoff season. So this is during the basic load. Because of the spring in Afton, you cannot see the periodicity during the peak runoff. So it'll be interesting to see how the spring reacts during the times of higher uh, higher Any other questions or comments? Right. Well, thanks a lot. So that concludes our uh, meeting. Please do uh, renew your membership. Uh, it's getting that time again. No order. No order. Good job of treating a lot of them. I think it's hard to do that job. I just had the tour. It can be a fairly dry subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We really don't work on that. I try to look at the lefty data and I know it's Yeah. Well, it gets broken, but if you need any of the data, the data is all there. So, any members do